Uh, this morning, we are going to speak on pride. Yay. <laughs> don't worry, I'm an expert. I'm proud to tell you that I don't struggle with pride. When it comes to humility, nobody does it better. It's a risky joke if you're a visitor here and you don't know my humor, isn't it? I'm going to get some emails later, so. Hey, um, we are going to be looking at the story of a guy named Naaman. Okay, everybody say that with me, Naaman. Naaman, okay? We all know how to say it correctly, but we're going to say, we're going to do the old tomato-tomato approach this morning, and we're just going to say Naaman, okay? It's just a lot easier than every time we say it to say Naaman. We're just going to say Naaman, okay? Everybody okay with that? All right. It'll make the morning go much faster. So, would you please be so kind to stand for the reading of God's Word? It's a long one, so stick in there with me, okay? It's a good story, though. Now, Naaman, Naaman, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and now she served Naaman's wife. She she said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, who would cure him of leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elijah, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have you come to me? Have him come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to him, go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. Your flesh will be restored and will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me, stand and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters in Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in rage. Naven's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman came to all his attendants, backed then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there's there is no God in all the world except Israel. So please accept this gift from your servant. Thank you. You may be seated. We'll go ahead and stop there. Good story, huh? One of my favorites. It's a great story of a man that was filled with pride, but God used his, the people around him and his circumstances, his illness, to bring him to the point of humility and faith. So this building was built in 1931. And if you didn't recognize when you drove up this morning, it kind of looks like a castle. It's made of rock. Guess what happens to rock in the summertime? It feels like an oven. My oven, or my office, is at the top of that oven. (laughs) And um, do you remember like back in the day when you make a turkey and they had those little things on them that it would pop out like when it was done? That happens to my belly button. And (laughs) sorry for the imagery. But in the summertime, when it's in the 90s, Um, my office is like in the hundreds. It gets really hot up there. So even if we turn the air conditioning on, for whatever reason, my office just can't keep up. So we got one of those portable air conditionings, like 32 million BTU, like, you know, those 
it's made by Toshiba and it hooks to the window and you can see it out front and it just, so it's made by Toshiba, but I call it Shiba. And Shiba is like my best friend. When I first got Shiba, if you walked in my office, I introduced you to Shiba. And I always talk about Shiba. And my wife got concerned. She's like, do I have to worry about Shiba? Like, <laughs> who's this Shiba you're always talking about? So Shiba was just incredible. First two weeks. So my office was so hot that even in the mornings, like I come in early, like six or seven in the morning, and I could check it from my phone and it would still be 75 at six o'clock in the morning, but I could turn it on from my house before I, I came in. But when I come in in the morning, everything was great for the first two weeks. And I could keep my office at like 61. It was beautiful. <laughs> like a meat locker in there. People would walk in and like, what's going on? First two weeks was amazing. I'm sitting at my desk. All of a sudden, I hear this tick, 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 Shiva. <laughs> Shiva, what is that? Tick, 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 tick. It sounded like water dripping on the fan. So I'm like, all right. So I, I check the, I drain it because you know, it's like humidifier type of thing. And then still tick, 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 tick. What in the world is that? Anybody else go crazy from noises? So just me, like tick, 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 tick. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Let it go for about a week. And then, then I'm just going insane. This tick, 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 tick. Brand new air conditioning unit. Sheba, I've had enough. I break out the drill and I tear Sheba apart. I know, it's brand new. Guess what I found? A candy wrapper from China. It has Chinese writing on it and everything. Um, it was put together in the factory in China. I, I verified where it was put together. And it passed inspection and went through everything. But this was caught on the wheel. And somewhere in there, it got left. And it was going tick, 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 after all this time. And yes, I've carried this in my wallet for two years because I knew someday it would be a sermon illustration. No joke. Now I can throw it away. I've used it. But I think that that's the same thing with pride. We think we've taken care of it. It's past inspection, right? It's all good. But then it's sneaky. And all of a sudden we hear this tick, tick, tick. And it shows up in our life. Tick, tick, tick. So what do we do when it suddenly appears? When we see it sneaking in, when we thought everything was good, when it passed that inspection and, and everything's going great and all of a sudden tick, tick, tick shows up. How do, how do we handle that? And that's what we're going to look at this story today and ask ourselves, how do we address pride when it starts sneaking in or better yet, how do we keep it from sneaking in? But I, I really don't know what the answer is. I mean, think about a sin that doesn't root itself back to pride. I really don't think there's ever an answer to be able to, how do you rid yourself of pride completely? I don't think there's anybody in here that can say, I've conquered pride. There's always going to be a time when pride sneaks back in and we have that tick, tick, tick. So how do you handle that when it starts to sneak back in? We're going to look at the story today and try to answer that question. So look at verse one with me. We've got a lot to cover today, so we're going to try to just keep rolling here. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Okay, who was this Naaman guy? Classic number two. I know it's a bad example to give, but I think of the movie Gladiator. You know, I think of Russell Crowe, you know, the, the classic number two. You know, he's got the king's ear because he gets things done. The king can say, hey, I want this done. He goes out to war. He goes out to battle. He gets it done and he can come back and the king says, great job. He commands a certain air about him when he walks. People get out of the way. You see him going down the road, people clear the way. He comes into the room, people snap too. He has a certain way that he dresses. He commands respect and a fear from everybody around him. He has money. He has position. He has power. Seems like he has it all, right? But, and this is a big one, he has leprosy. Now, it's important to understand that leprosy was used to describe any number of skin ailments at the time. But we know that it was probably pretty bad because he's willing to go to another country 
to get it resolved. I'm willing to travel. I'm willing to take all this money with me to try to get this taken care of. It seems like everything was, was going well for him, and then suddenly, uh-oh, leprosy. Can you imagine waking up and seeing that first spot? And it starts to callous a little bit more, and if you know anything about leprosy, it, it develops worse and worse, and pretty soon your, your toes and your fingers and your nose and things can just start to fall off, and it gets worse and worse, and it's kind of like pride. Leprosy of pride, right? It gets worse and worse. You know, we've read the stories about leprosy, Mike. But if he had leprosy, how was he allowed to be a commander of the army? You know, that is a great question. I'm glad you asked. Man, you guys are on top of it this morning. (laughs) So, yes, in Israel, Jewish law said that you were unclean if you had leprosy. You actually had to walk around saying, unclean, unclean, stay away. You, You were an outcast in Israel under Jewish law. Where was he from? Aram, which is now Syria. That was pagan law. So he wasn't under the Jewish law. He was in Syria, in Aram. So he wasn't living by the same laws. The pagan culture did not abide by the same Jewish laws that they did. So he was still allowed to go about his day, and he could still be a commander in the army that he was. Make sense? Different culture, different laws. Okay, so there's one big thing that we need to look of look at in verse one. Verse one. Let's look again. Now Naaman was commander of the army of King Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Okay, did you catch it? Because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Naaman was a proud man, but either unaware or unwilling to see the Lord had given him victory. See, that's where pride takes over. We need to be aware ourselves that all that we have and all that we are has come from the Lord. He has a lot to be prideful about in his life, but he doesn't recognize that, not really, because it's the Lord that, happened for him, right? The Lord did it. He's walking around with these victories on his shoulder, but it was the Lord that gave him the victories. But we kind of do that ourselves, don't we? So how do we, how do we keep that pride from sneaking in in our lives? Well, that, that's our first, first point is this. We need to acknowledge what God has already done in our lives. See, there there isn't a person in this room that isn't guilty of this. We look at our lives and we take credit for all of our accomplishments, and yet we forget about all the prayers that we said on the way asking for God's help. Let me give you an example. God, I'm not going to make the rent this month. God, I'm not going to be able to pay the bills. Help. God, help me. I, I need the finances this month. Can you help me out? And then the phone call happens. Hey, can you pick up a shift this week? Hey, we need you to do some overtime. All right, all right. I don't want to, but I will. Guess what? End of the month, you made the rent, you paid the bills. Then what do you say? I had to work extra. I did it. Look at all the, all the stuff that I had to do. And we forget to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for providing the overtime. Thank you for providing the extra shift. And we take credit for what we did and not the prayer that we prayed saying, God, will you help me make this happen? We do it all the time in our lives. We take credit for everything that happens in our lives, even though we prayed for God to help us make it happen, right? When pride starts to sneak in, we need to acknowledge all the things that God has done in our lives. If we just had an attitude of recognizing that God did this and God did that, our pride wouldn't be so much of an issue. Okay, but we're only on verse one, so we gotta keep moving. Unless we're ordering pizza and that we'll be here all day. All right, verse two. 
Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure, of him, cure him of leprosy. Now, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl had said, what the girl from Israel had said. Now, there can be a whole sermon just in those two verses right there, two through four, those three verses, right? But I, I want to take a little, little step here. It, that, it brings us to our next step, if you will. Because if we're going to let pride sneak in, when pride starts to sneak in, your next step needs to be this. You need to listen to wise counsel. But what, what is wise counsel? Wise counsel is this. Wise counsel points you to God. So we all have those people that try to counsel us, right? Listen, this is what you need to do. We all have those people in our lives, right? But wise counsel, wise counsel points you to God. But it's funny how our trials bring us to that place of openness. A man of pride like Naaman I mean, just look at where he's at. But a man of pride like Naaman probably would not have been willing to listen to the words of a slave girl. Think about the, the difference in culture and society. She's from another country and she was brought over as a slave girl. She was probably somebody that when he, he walked in the room, she had to exit. She had to look away. But now because of where he was at in his leprosy, he was... He was willing to listen to the words of the slave girl. It's funny how our trials and desperation bring us to that point of openness. If he would have allowed his pride to get in the way and not listen, he wouldn't have been healed. But I want to take a little sidestep, if you will, in the sermon here, a little dosy do This girl, she's my hero. There's, I don't think too often we, we slow down in a story enough to acknowledge these characters in the Bible and these stories. They're there for a reason. You know, sometimes I, I look at characters in the Bible that I'd like to meet and we think about, oh, I'd love to sit down and have a coffee with Moses. No, I want to sit down with this, this young girl right here. She would be one of them. Think about her situation. The, the word translates to young maiden. She was a young girl. She was taken in a raid from her home in Israel, her home in Samaria. Lost everything, her family, her friends, her home. And was now taken and made to be a servant, a slave in a foreign country. And what's her attitude? I don't know about you, but I'd be tempted to want the worst for my captor. My captor's suffering from leprosy. I don't know. I, I'd probably want to see the guy's nose fall off. <laughs> I, I know that seems mean, but I'm just being honest. Like, hey, I want to see you suffer a little bit. You took me away from my mom. You took me away from dad and my friends. And you're making me a slave now. I'm just a little girl. But that's not her attitude. What's her attitude? What is she saying? She's saying, look at my God. If only you could see what my God could do. This little girl's my hero. I want to be more like her. In our life circumstances, do people look at us and see us be bitter? Do we allow our pride to make us bitter? Because our pride is going to tell us that we deserve better and it's not fair. But she kept her eyes on God and she was the wise counsel. But what about our circumstances? Do we allow our pride to make us bitter? When people look at us, do we say, look at my God? Or do they look at us and we say, this isn't fair. I deserve better. Don't you know who I am? When it isn't fair at work, when the illness strikes, what do people see? 
Do we say, look at my God. Look what my God can do. Or do they see our pride? Don't let pride keep you from listening to wise counsel and don't let pride keep you from being wise counsel. Okay. do si do back to the verse. Look at verse five through eight. Okay, this is the king responding to Naaman's request to go see the, see the prophet. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels. Okay, that's like 750 pounds of silver, like 200 pounds of gold. He's taken with him a lot. 10 sets of clothing. The letter then that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you that you may cure him of leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elijah, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So the king of Aram, his name is Benadad. He sends Naaman down with this letter, right? He sends him to this king named Jerohom. So why does Jerohom get so upset? You have to understand the, the circumstance between these two guys. Jerohom and Benadad, these two kings, there's a history of battle between these two countries. It goes all the way back to first kings. There's a big battle between the two countries. Jerohom's dad was Ahab. And Ahab and Benadad got in this big battle with each other to the point where they finally got this, this treaty, a loose treaty, if you will. But there was still a quarrel between them. There was still, still raids. And I think it was kind of like a couple brothers that are they're picking at each other constantly. Like, I know you are, but what am I? And I'm not touching you. You're looking at me, that kind of thing. That's the kind of relationship that they had. So when he sends this letter down with him and name it and says, hey, heal this guy. Look, you know, I can't do that. What are you, you're just trying to make me look bad. You're trying to make me look bad in everybody, in front of everybody. Is that, is that what you're doing here? Are you trying to pick another fight? Is that a quarrel? Does that make sense? So he's just trying to pick a fight. That's all he's doing. But Jerohom, he's a king of Israel, but he's not following God. He, he's not looking to God through any of this. He, he's not a, a God follower, if you will. Now, Elisha, he's a prophet of, of God, but Jerohom doesn't, doesn't look to him and say, hey, what should we do? Elisha, let's say, he doesn't have any friends in high places, if you will, in politics. He's, he's tolerated at best. Because they know that God's, God's on his side and they, they tolerate him on the outskirts. He's there. But Jerohom, he's going to go about his own business. And, he, and he's not about following God. And he's going to freak out when stuff like this happens. And he's going to do his own thing. But Elijah hears about it and says, you know what? Send him to me. Let me show him that there's a, a prophet. Let me show him what God can do. Make sense? Okay, verse nine. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped by the door of Elijah's house. Elijah set up a messenger, sent a messenger to him and said, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought you'd be... I thought he would surely come out to me, stand and stand and call in the name of the Lord, his God. Wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers Damascus, better than all the waters in Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in rage. See, this is where Naaman's pride really shines. Don't you know who I am? You're not even going to come out and greet me? You know, he's used to people jumping when he says jump. <laughs> he's used to people doing what he asked. He had expectations of what was going to happen. And he certainly was too proud to be seen in the, the dirty waters of the Jordan. I mean, the, the rivers where I come from, you should see those. 
Those rivers are, are far cleaner and better. Why wouldn't I just go wash in those? Why, why should I get dirty in your dirty Jordan River over here? This is, this is not what I expected to happen. You, here's how it's going to go down. You're going to come out of your house. You're going to wave your hand over it. I'm going I'm to give you this stuff, and then I'm going to go home, and it's going to be all better. It's interesting how Elijah didn't come out of the house, though, isn't it? He just sent a messenger. Elisha could be making sure that it, it, it's clear that God's the one doing the healing. There's no doubt that, hey, if I come out and heal you, you're going to be like, Elisha, he's the man. Elisha did it. But I think it's God's way of dealing with the greater need. See, Naaman's greater need wasn't his leprosy, it was his heart. It's kind of the same with all of us, right? It's always a greater need that we have. If Elijah came out and healed him, Naaman would have just rode off and went back. But he wouldn't have dealt with the pride issues. Just like all of us, we get so wrapped up in our circumstances that we allow our pride and expectations to tell us how it should be and that it's not fair and we don't see that God is working on our greater need. But God, why, why aren't you answering this prayer? God, I've been praying, why aren't you dealing with this? God, why aren't you, and we don't see the bigger picture, the, the greater need that God is working on. But we need to acknowledge our greatest need has been met, amen? Our need for forgiveness, our need for salvation. Okay, look at verses 13 through 14. Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Once again, we see the need to listen to wise counsel. See, Naaman's pride was getting in the way of his obedience to God. I like to give him a hard time here, but I can't say that I'm any different. I think I'm just as guilty. I like to speak for you guys too, but I'll let you do that. I think we've all been. But when we find ourselves in that place, we need to obey God. Okay, but when you say obey God, how do I even know what God is saying, Mike? I get that, I get that a lot. Okay, how do, I, how do I know what God is saying? Okay, but let's start with this. I mean, it's going to look different for each one of us. Maybe he's saying sit still. Maybe he's saying move. But let's start right here with what you know for sure. Start with being obedient with what it says right here. Read your Bible, pray, be baptized, love your neighbor. He gives you plenty of things right here, pretty clear on what to be obedient about, right? And yet we're constantly saying, what am I supposed to obey? What, am I, what is God telling me to do? It's right here. Let's start right here. Let's start in learning to hear God's voice and learning to hear what God is saying right here. Be obedient to what God is calling you to do. When your pride is sneaking in, open this up. But how often our pride gets in the way when we're, when we're being obedient. The pride gets in the way and we're not obedient. Well, God can't really be asking me to do that. Come on, I have two doctorates. God can't be calling me to sweep the floors, really. I mean, God can't be calling me to do that. Or it's silly how we get in the way, our pride gets in the way of things. So I, I was a missionary down in Ecuador, and there's a, a village called Shandia right down in the jungles. Um, and we did a, a VBS for a team that came down there a vacation Bible school. And I had a bunch of kids and the, the parents were all in the back. We did an altar call. I had some kids at VBS that accepted Jesus. And it was an incredible time. And after VBS was done at the end of the week, the 
it was raining like it always does in the jungles in Ecuador. And But I, I'd lived there long enough, I knew that when it rained, the, the rivers swelled up. And afterwards, the, the team said, hey, we go swimming in the jungle, or go swimming in the river. And I, uh, no, but I caved the, the pressure. All right, let's go. So a bunch of the kids and the team and everybody went, jumped in the, jumped in the river. And I just, I just, all right. And I went down around the bend and I just kind of put myself on a rock. Just kind of felt like God was saying, go down there. Sure enough, not three minutes went by. And I see a guy coming around the bend, hand in the air, flailing. Bloop, down he goes. Comes back up. Arms flat, and he says, help, and goes under again. And he's, the water's going pretty fast, and he's drifting towards me. And he goes under again. And I'm trying to time it, time it so when I see him. And I jump in, and I, I swim out, and I get him. And it's not a slow-motion Baywatch, like, <laughs> But I was able to get him, get him to the side, and get him on his side, and get the water coming out, and he was Okay. But that night, he, he shared with some of us that during VBS, he was one of the parents that were standing in the back. And he felt God tell him to come forward during the altar call. But he was embarrassed because that was for the kids. He was too proud. How often in our lives do we let our pride keep us from being obedient to what God is calling us to do? In his case, it was one of those life or death situations. But we never know what that situation is going to be. Every day, we feel like God is calling us to do something, say something, do something, and we come up with excuses on our head as to why we can't. And often it's just our pride. When that pride starts sneaking in, we need to stand firm and just be obedient. Okay, the final step. When that pride is sneaking in is this. Proclaim who God is. Look at verse 15. The Naaman, all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know there is no God in all the world except Israel. See, Naaman was no longer filled with pride. He was proclaiming God's name. It's hard to make it all about you when you're focused on the truth of who God is. We need to spend more time talking about who God is and less time building ourselves up, amen? It's a comedian, Brian Regan, talks about never tell a two-molar story. Never tell a two-wisdom tooth story because you can never, oh, I had two wisdom teeth taken out. Never start that story because somebody in the room is always going to be like, I had all four of mine taken out. They were all compacted and the nerves were wrapped around my big toe and they had to go in sideways. And somebody's always going to top your story, right? Never tell a two wisdom two story. Somebody in the room's always like, well, that's nothing. Me, 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 me. Oh, well, I, well, I. It's all about us. Why can't we be like that girl and say, look at my God. Look at my God. Look what my God can do. No, it's me, me, I, I. When we see that pride sneaking in and we can recognize that, we need to proclaim who God is. There is no God in all the world. Naaman was able to get rid of his pride and he is proclaiming who God is. And it's hard to make it all about you when you're focused on the truth of who God is. Spend more time in our lives proclaiming God instead of ourselves. You know, it often comes down to with our pride is expectations. Often our pride causes us to create these expectations. I, I expect to be treated a certain way. I, I show them love, so I expect them to show me love back. I was nice to them, so I expect them to be nice back. I, I expect them to say sorry first. Don't you know who I am? They hurt me, so I expect them to make the first move. 
We do it with our spouses. We do it with our kids. I am the parent, so I expect them to behave a certain way. I expect them to do what I say. I have expectations. I don't care if they have feelings. I'm the parent. I expect things to be a certain way. That one hit a chord with some people, huh? does with me. We do it with God. We even pray for miracles, but we have expectations on how we got, want God to perform that miracle. God, I need a miracle in my life, and here's how I want you to perform it. We laugh, but it's so true, isn't it? God, here's how I want you to work. Maybe it's not even a miracle, but it's like, God, here's, here's my request, and here's how I want you to lay it out for me. Here's A, B, and C, and if it's not going to play out that way, then I'm going to be upset with you. Look at Naaman. I want you to cleanse, cleanse my leprosy, and here's, you're going to come out of the house. You're going to wave your hand over it. If it's not done that way, then I'm not about it. Yeah, I got to go dip in the river. Come on. We have expectations. Here's your take-home truth. We let go of pride when our greatest expectation is for God's glory. When you walk into that situation at work and your temptation is to say, I deserve better than this. This isn't fair. And your pride is sneaking in. It's a very different state situation when you're walking in with an expectation of God's glory. My greatest expectation is for God to be glorified through this situation. It's really hard for your pride to be in the way. When my greatest expectation is for God's glory as I'm parenting, it's really hard for my pride to be in the way. As a spouse, my greatest expectation is for God's glory. It's really hard for my pride to be in the way. When I, when I start hearing the tick, 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 I need a pause. I start thinking about God's glory and then not, not just start thinking about myself and doing the me, me, me and the eyes. And I deserve better, and this isn't fair, and why do they get that, and I don't, and don't they know, and I should, and God, I know you're working on the greater need. God, I know it's about you and your glory. God, help me work on my pride. Let me proclaim your name for your glory. When people look at me, Lord, I pray. I pray they look at me, and I am saying, Look at my God. Look at his glory. And I'm not sitting there bitter and saying this isn't fair. I deserve better and it's about me. I want to be proclaiming my God and it's about him for his glory. Because I'm proud of him and who he is and what he's done for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you are in our lives. We thank you that you're not done with any of us yet. If we're honest with ourselves, we know that we, each and every one of us, struggle with pride each and every day. And yet you continue to help us each and every day. Lord, today we ask for wisdom courage and strength as we start to recognize that tick, tick, tick in our lives and that pride is sneaking in. Lord, help us. Help us to listen to wise counsel. Help us to be obedient. Help us to proclaim your name. Lord, we want to proclaim your name far and wide that you may be glorified in this earth. We were created for your glory, Lord. We want to recognize all that you have done in our lives and you give you the glory for it. Lord, we are so thankful for the blessings that you bestow upon us. Forgive us for the times that we have taken credit for those many blessings. 
Lord, we come before you now and humbly just say thank you. Thank you for your blessings in our lives. Thank you for all that you are, Lord. You are worthy, worthy of all our praise. All that we have is yours. All that we have has come from you, Lord, and we come before you and just say thank you. We love you. Amen.